you're looking at right now are two of the lowest end one wheels being compared for climbing and turning performance. One falls flat on its face and the other cruises right on up. What's the difference? Introducing the Vesk Pint V Pimved Pumpft project. Uh, a modification that unleashes the true potential of this micro missile in ways never thought possible. Capable of reaching speeds up to 20 miles per hour and the power to decimate hills like the pint never could before. All while enabling key features such as charge and ride functionality and advanced detailed tuning controls, as well as some special features only found in the latest flagships. In this video, I will go over every step in swapping a stock pint controller over to a U Box single VESC. I will also cover first time firmware setup as well as motor and app configuration. I will also demonstrate what the end result is truly capable of on some off-road situations. Now before we begin this project, I want to start off with a warning that this is potentially very dangerous and if you are not aware of what you are doing, I recommend you not attempt this. I also highly discourage doing this if you only own a single board as there is a good chance problems arise. Hardware can arrive faulty or a mistake in wiring could cause permanent damage. Do consider the time you would like to continue riding. Maybe it could be a good winter project. This project alone has tested my ability to troubleshoot and has thrown plenty of wrenches at me over the last two months. That's not trying to scare you, but think about this project rationally. You will need time to make it good. Needless to say, I am not responsible for you causing injury or fire based on this video. The quality of modification is solely up to you. I want this video to come across as more of a walkthrough than a definitive guide. Everyone's situation is different, and there are methods and solutions in this video that are not up to everyone's spec. So, I guess this is where I should explain what a VESC is and what we're actually doing here. In short, VESC is an open source motor controller with a bunch of cool sensors and I.O. capabilities that can adapt to a plethora of different applications. If you are interested in a deeper dive into its history with one wheel and more discussion on the right to repair, definitely be sure to check out Mario's video on the subject. So the three critical aspects of the VESC hardware that we need to be present include the IMU, which is a small surface mount device equipped with an accelerometer and gyroscope for sensing tilt and changes in velocity, ADC ports for detecting the presence of analog signals to be interpreted and utilized by the VESC to perform certain actions, and of course it just needs to be compact enough to fit in a pint enclosure, and that should be all that we need. Now I'm only explaining that to you in case the recommendation I am going to give becomes obsolete for some unknown reason. But I also figured it would be important to note, as those are all the sensors that we need to run a one wheel. The VESC replaces the stock controller, this blue oddly shaped thing sometimes present with some dings from a poorly designed power switch. With that upgrade comes some benefits but also some drawbacks that we will have to be aware of. For one, leaderboards will no longer work because we don't use the one wheel app anymore. Anyway, for the benefits, there is greatly increased torque which will increase the threshold where acceleration, climbing, or rough terrain will result in a nosedive increasing safety of the rider drastically. Higher and completely configurable top speed, which is normally based on motor power, but can also be configured as a fixed absolute speed. Also note, we're talking about pushback thresholds. Balanced vehicles cannot limit their top speed in a literal sense. It can only warn you about when to slow down. Freedom, and that's covering a lot of things, but it matters a lot. Raising the locks on anything you use day to day is paramount to prolonging its life and value. If you can accomplish this mod, not only do you create an overall more powerful and safer device, but you also become the board's technician expert and instantly have access to all the diagnostics you need to figure out what the problems are and how to solve them. Adding on to that very relevant reason, another aspect of that freedom comes for granted as VESC is open source. Almost every parameter, every setting can be tweaked to as fine or as broad as you could possibly want. Want your nose angle to be set at 22 degrees for some reason? You can do that. Want to stand your board up on its end and have it balance itself? Fuck it, go right ahead. I've been left in the dark riding around on a one wheel that has zero ride customization other than three real ride modes and a baby mode. Honestly, it's sad because now I know how easy it actually is to implement. I mean guys, the GT hasn't even been blessed with a custom shaping mode even after the vest became this huge topic. Alright, alright, I think I'm finally done wasting your time, so let's get right into the disassembly. Starting off, we are going to take a quick glance at the object we are looking at to confirm that this is indeed a one wheel. Secondly, we are going to make a swift strike on the axle bolts with our driver. Take your time with these please, and only use the correct bit and method for breaking the Loctite on these for the first time. There are horror stories around stripped axle bolts and I am super lucky to not have experienced this first hand yet. 
Anyway, we're gonna go around the bottom side, removing all of the accessory fasteners, and we finally take off the rear foot pad, which sends me into a brief trance that results in some additional research and development, but, uh... What is that? Wow, that looks so fucking clean! That's kind of insane, mine looks like shit. Carrying on, we have probably the easiest disassembly part, consisting of four screws and some finagling. Then we are going to make a quick spin around, making sure that our tire does indeed make squeaky tire noises, and start to attack the front controller housing and front sensor pad. And unplugging the front sensor finally gives me the confidence that yes, I can indeed use Future Motion's advanced tools. The next stage involves finally removing the right side rail, which I have strategically chosen as it will give me ample room to safely remove the motor connector later on. It's a great thing that I didn't end up utilizing that strategy. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. For this particular instance, I had no idea what I was doing. And with one rail removed and the internal separated, we finally have what we came here for. A wheel on a stick. It's like most of the weight. <laughs> and there you have it. We have separated all of the major components of the board. Now we are ready for the next step. The battery housing contains the battery management system, which we have to bypass in order for this modification to work reliably. In this step, we will also enable the ability to charge and ride this board at the same time. A BMS bypass essentially converts the BMS into what we call a charge-only BMS. What that means is that while usually the BMS has control over the discharge path and charge path to the battery cells, we are now bypassing the switch for the output, meaning the BMS will have no ability to cut off power while we are riding around. I imagine that the BMS has no idea that its switching MOSFET is completely shorted, and in testing with multiple people, the rest of the BMS's functions remain unchanged, so in my mind it's safe to use. So it appears we have here a Qi battery systems court upgrade in place of the stock battery. Vest can utilize any battery that meets the voltage specification, and the battery should be built to handle the amperage draw necessary. In this case, because we have a quart, we have access to quite a bit higher amperage capacity, and we can draw more current from this pack to make our VESC upgrade even more powerful. After removing the BMS cover, you should take extra caution when poking around, as we are dealing with a very potent battery. You see that? See how it's not fully seated? It should be like... Like that. <laughs> okay, I got it. Can take this off. Okay, so. Hello, hello everyone. This is me from the future letting you all know that it is extremely important to not allow the balance connector to be connected to the battery alone. Always unplug the balance first and plug the balance in last. All right, apologies for this interruption, but that was, I want to avoid people blowing things up. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Really do not want to break right now. And hopefully won't. With our BMS separated, it is time to perform the bypass. What I like to do first is prepare the surfaces for solder. Here I'm using a razor and etching a small section of the solder blob in order to grant the iron sufficient contact in order to heat it. The rest of the conformal coating will be easily pushed away as you melt the solder. I then like to take some solid core house wiring and cut two angled faces on the sides. This will allow it to sit nicely between the two pins and make soldering a lot easier. Now I really hope that you either have a very patient other set of hands or one of these fancy holder thingies. They are incredibly helpful, especially with stuff like this. Be very sure to let the solder fully melt all the way around the connection to ensure the best electrical contact.
Now with the bypass in place, you can move it aside somewhere safe and get right into the controller housing. The same pentalobe security screws are present here along with an equally obnoxious o-ring. I have solutions to help with the o-ring receding later if you have issues. There you go, looks pretty. As a non-scientific comparison, I wanted to see how the size of the stock MOSFETs were compared to the FETs on the U-Box. As you can see, the U-Box ones are quite a bit larger. We're just going to basically unplug everything. Taking the stock controller out of the housing requires removing six screws, the plastic nuts on the motor and foot pad connectors, as well as carefully loosening the PCB off of the thermal pad, which can take a bit of force. PCB, very nice. There's a little cutout thing, so it's all aluminum. And you can see this is an older model where the nut there is actually metal. So a common problem with these is that this nut would actually shear off. It would come down these really tiny wires. It would damage right here where this Bluetooth module is because it sits right there in the past. Like bang against it over and over and over and then people would get like Bluetooth errors or that just the Bluetooth would completely stop working entirely. And it's all because of this metal nut. With most of the components removed, the first irreversible step can be made that being drilling out of two standoffs in order to make room for the new controller. Did I mention that you should probably watch the entire video first just to make sure that none of the later steps might stall the project? I also do have a potential solution to this, but all in all, we will have to do some damaging modifications to at least the lid. So there's a bit of excess, but we're gonna probably sand that. Oh no, 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 do, don't do this. this. This is really stupid. Get yourself a real Dremel or a nice sharp pair of flush cutters. Uh, what I'm painfully trying to do is cut down these ribs on the lid. They're there to strengthen the lid, I guess. It's not really vital at all. There isn't a lot of pressure on the lid because there's an air gap between the pad and the lid anyway. So uh, I, I don't know, figure out a better way to cut these off and uh, get back to me. Alright, it is finally time to get into some electrical stuff. The hub motor present on the pint terminates with a custom style connector we assume was designed by FM and is not publicly available to purchase on its own anywhere. Therefore, we will make our own. Based off of someone else's design, I created a revised model of a printable motor connector that we can construct to fit in its place. It will connect to the motor flawlessly if built correctly. I will walk you through it. In order to start, we should make sure that we have everything that we need. I have a few Amazon links with the necessary parts in order to construct the connector. You will need 40mm male pin headers, 2mm bullet connectors, a 3D printer, and some epoxy, as well as general electrical tools like a soldering iron. I also wish that the 2mm bullets were a bit longer to make this process easier. To solve this, I found myself some butt connectors that I ended up adding to the end in order to lengthen the part. I definitely want to look into better ways of easily extending these connectors. 
the motor connector was printed on an Ender 3 3D printer using PETG filament with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. A 0.3 or 0.2 nozzle may yield cleaner results, though resin printers will certainly make this kind of print a cakewalk. Using the female end of the 2 millimeter connector, we are going to attach the extension and solder it in place. Make sure that you allow the solder to fully wick into the connector by applying the proper amount of heat. Do this for all three, and then grab some 12 gauge silicon wire and solder it to the end of our connector. The purpose of this additional wire is to create an easier connection point for when you wire up the VESC. You could also add your own bullet connectors here if you want to be able to remove it. After you finish the first part, make sure to check fitment into the printed shell and check the amount sticking out in the front. You will want to be sure it pokes out about half a millimeter below the top surface. It's not critical to be exact right now, we just need to make sure that it can get there at all. After you've completed all three phase pins, take a look at some of the packages received alongside the U-Box. Inside, you should find a motor sense cable with six pins on it. This will plug into the hall sense port on the U-Box. On the other end, we are going to prepare the motor sensor pins by first cutting off the motor side cable and pre-tinning the ends of the wires. We will then grab our 40 millimeter standoffs and start soldering them to the ends. Once this is complete, we must apply heat shrink. Electrical tape is not allowed in this application. The sizing for the heat shrink is really whatever fits snug enough before heating, but you should consider the added thickness if you are using double walled type, which can change the dimension enough to where you can't fit all the pins anymore. Also be careful that you are leaving enough of the pin exposed so that it inserts into the connector body enough. With all that preparation work complete, the final assembly can be performed. Grab yourself some two-part epoxy and your motor. We are going to connect the ends together and begin inserting the sensor pins. Here's a pinout guide for making sure all the pins are connected to the correct spot. The U-Box has markings that show what each pin is for. Be sure to sufficiently insert the pins all the way until they feel snug. We are then going to position and securely affix the motor connector into an upright position. Find yourself a good tool to apply the epoxy in the gap created on the printed part, and begin mixing. Carefully apply the epoxy to the connector, making sure to allow the epoxy to flow into the gaps between the wires and connector body as well as between the wires themselves. A heat gun set to low can help make the epoxy less viscous and allow it to flow better. Well, would you look at the time. It seems that this video has taken six months to actually create, and that's not particularly impressive. I think I want to split this video into two parts so that people can follow at least the initial preparation and be prepared for when the next video drops. If you end up following this guide and want to finish before the next one comes around, feel free to join the Veskify Discord server. I will have a link below to a permanent invite. Make sure if you do pop in uh, to tell them I sent you, it would be much appreciated. Thank you all for watching, I hope the first installment into this hopefully ongoing channel has left somewhat a decent first impression. Oh, I did want to mention that the mic inconsistency is entirely my fault. I switched like halfway through, so if that was jarring, I apologize. And it won't be present in the next video. Anyway, stay warm, and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.